Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our fourth webinar of our ISDM knowledge series. Today, our webinar would help you all understand what you can do differently next time when there is a problem to deal with. Thinking is one of the critical skills that contributes to our ability to make profound decisions. For matters related to our personal lives, business, public policy, environment, etc., our world is full of complexities, some of which we understand and most that we don't. But we still take decisions to live through this complexity. Our decisions regularly get challenged and the outcomes often surprises us. How can we improve our ability to deal with surprises emerging through the real world complexities and take decisions which are more systemic in nature? Systems thinking is one of the ways to achieve this. Thinking in systems is essentially a way of comprehending real world systems by studying their interactions and how those impact their own behavior. In this introductory webinar, we will talk about what systems thinking is and what it is not. Our speaker for today's webinar is Mr. Mihir Mathur. He is an interdisciplinary researcher working on sustainability and climate change issues with an aim to develop systemic solutions. His expertise is in systems thinking, system dynamics modeling, group model building, climate change adaption, and natural resource management. Mihir began his career in banking and stock markets and moved into the world of sustainability research in 2009. He worked in the climate change adaptation program of Watershed Organization Trust, Pune, before moving to Terry, New Delhi. He has written book chapters, journal papers, and presented his work in several conferences worldwide. So over to you, Mihir. Thank you very much, Parivasha. And uh, good evening to everyone. I'm very happy to be here uh, doing this webinar. And we hope that we have a mutually beneficial experience. So let me uh, project the slides that I've prepared for the session. So the topic today is systems thinking what it is and what it isn't. Let me get the system to function properly. All right. So let's begin. So the structure of the webinar is we will touch upon uh, what system thinking, uh, introduction to systems thinking. Then we have some points uh, showing what systems thinking is and what it is not, followed by a question and answer session for why all of you. So we will try to spend around 35 to 40 minutes in point one, two, and three, followed by a 15 to 20 minutes of question and answer session where you have the opportunity to ask questions and we'll try best to respond to as many questions as possible. So let's see. So the question I have is why do we need a systems approach? Uh, here I would like to bring in a point that we live in a world uh, where we have multiple perspectives about a common reality. Uh, let me give you an example here of the elephant and the blind men. So this image shows that there are five blind men trying to figure out the common reality, which is an elephant. And each of the blind men is able to touch a part of the elephant and make sense of what the elephant is. So the man on the top says an elephant is like a brush. The man who has got the hold of the tail says the elephant is like a rope. The blind man who's holding the trunk of the elephant says, you know, elephant is like a snake. And then the man below says, you know, elephant is like a tree trunk. While the man at the far end says, you know, I've got my hands dirty in it. An elephant is soft and mushy. That's very hard to imagine or to understand for them, which one of them is right and which one of them is wrong. 
because all of them have got the partial understanding of reality right. So none of them is wrong, but at the same time, none of them is right. Let me replace the elephant uh, with sustainable development. Let's say the reality we all of us are trying to figure out is sustainable development. So one of us says, you know, sustainable development is an educational problem. We need to work on education. The other person says, no, it's a political problem. We need to have political bill. Third person says, no, it's a natural resource problem. Uh, resource depletion is really, really causing uh, unsustainability. And then the fourth, the fourth person says, it's a social systems problem. We need to solve it using a social sciences view. And then we say, no, it is an economic problem. We need to have economic solutions to it. Again, all of us have got the reality partially correct, but we, none of us individually have really sensed what this big elephant is. So our approach to solving the problem is pretty much in silos. Somebody is working on an education problem to figure out sustainable development. Somebody is working on an economic problem. So what is the issue here? The issue is that we have one big reality and we have simple assumptions about reality. And these simple assumptions about reality often proving, are often proving to be incomplete and ineffective. We have penalties and subsidies, which does not really help us improve people's behavior. Simple solutions make the big reality look simpler than it is. You just mitigate emissions to control climate change. But for all we know, Earth's climate has its own regulatory system, which cannot be controlled. We have to grow more food to eliminate hunger, but we have been growing more food, but we have not managed to eliminate hunger properly. Simpler understanding of big reality limits our rate of learning. We often get trapped in our disciplinary approaches to solve massive physical problems like literacy, poverty, hunger, resource depletion, but we are unable to come out of our disciplinary approaches to look at the big picture. So what are we unable to understand here? What are we unable to understand is that we have to look at the whole through the interaction of parts. Now, what do I mean by this? What I mean is that we have to understand how the environment, which is natural resources, interacts with the political system, how the political system interacts with social system, how the social system interacts with economic system and how the economic system interacts with the educational system, which again comes back and interacts with all of the rest. And so does all of the rest interact with each other. So it is through the interaction of these various disciplines, we start figuring out what the elephant looks like. So by studying interactions of parts and how these things interact with each other, we begin to understand reality as it emerges because the problems that we deal with in our real world situations, these are not tangible problems. You cannot really hold it, put it aside, and you say problem is solved. These problems emerge because of the interactions happening between various social, ecological, economic, political variables and factors at a community level, right up to the global level. So if you have to work on solving problems or dissolving problems, be it sustainable development goals. We have to understand the interactions of these various parts, which gives rise to the problems. And perhaps the problems are getting solved or becoming worse. What are the reasons for that? Systems thinking will help us understand reality better by studying interaction of the parts. But one cannot really understand reality in totality. If it was possible, then perhaps we could know everything. So systems thinking is not for knowing everything, but systems thinking is to improve our understanding of reality by studying how different sectors, parts, systems interact with each other, which give rise to our real world situations. So let's come back to a very basic question. What is a system and how do you define the system? A system is comprised of interdependent, interrelated, interconnected parts, which form a complex unified whole to achieve a functional purpose. Just like a human body. A human body is made up of different parts, 
our eye, our tongue, our heart, your brain, and all of these things interact with each other. And the human body forms a complex web of parts which are continuously interacting with each other to achieve some functional purpose. The functional purpose could be me speaking right now, you drinking water right now, or you watching something and taking a decision. The system maintains its existence through the mutual interaction of its parts. If there is no interaction, we call it a dead system. The system ceases to be alive. So how do you identify a system? A system is different from a collection of parts. A collection of parts is basically a heap. You can have a set of laptops kept together in a showroom. It's just a heap or inventory. Examples, stack of papers kept together, clothes put together, materials lying in a Buddha. Only parts kept in particular order or organized in some way is not a system. They could be part of a larger system, but they themselves does not have any existence because, they're mutual, because their parts are not mutually interacting. But the moment I open the laptop, plug it in, start the system, the system comes into existence. So does the human body and so does our social system. <clears throat> Examples of systems, human beings, communities, earth, football team, organizations, <clears throat> mechanistic systems, we are surrounded by that. Civilizations, economic system, all these are examples of systems. Wherever you think that you look at a system and it meets the criteria of interdependence, interconnected, interrelatedness, there is mutual interaction which leads to the emergence of the system's behavior over time, you can pretty, be, pretty much be sure that you are looking at a system. <clears throat> So what is the definition of systems thinking? If I have to say, give you a definition of systems thinking, if you have to go out and say, what systems thinking is? Here is one of the definitions. And I would encourage you to go out on the web, talk to people, read books, to improve this definition further. Systems thinking is a process of understanding relationships between variables within a system and between different systems and how their interaction leads to emergence of systems behavior. Now let's focus on four key elements in this definition. First, systems thinking is a process. It continues because we are improving our understanding. It's not an outcome in itself, but it is sort of an outcome in itself. And you improve your understanding about the process, about the relationships, which brings us to the third point, which is interactions. It is a process of understanding the interactions which leads to the emergence of systems behavior. The way I behave, the way my computer behaves, the way com communities behave, the way our economic system behaves, the way our industrial management process behaves, the way our social system behaves, and what leads to the emergence of systems behavior, which keeps changing over time. So if I have to compress this definition, I would say a shorter version of the definition is systems thinking is a process of understanding interactions of parts which lead to emergence of systems behavior. <clears throat> now, do two different systems could also be interacting with each other. For example, I'm interacting with all of you and very soon all of you would be interacting with me. So I as a system is interacting with all of you and we are using this computer and technology in the room to let these interactions happen. So what is emerging right now as a knowledge, as sound, as visuals is emerging through the interactions of all that is happening between us. So in this case, there are different systems which are interacting with each other. And say within my body, there are different parts which are interacting, which, which is giving rise to my voice, my gestures, the, my ability to look, hear, feel. So we are surrounded by the world of systems. The parts are interconnected within the system, different systems interact with each other. And that's what gives rise to the complexity in which we live. <clears throat> this complexity is very difficult for us to completely understand. <clears throat> and that's why some of the decisions we take often surprise us. We are hoping to expect an outcome, but very often we 
see unintended consequences of those outcomes. For example, the whole push or the whole motive of improving the agriculture productivity or production of the world led to the applications of fertilizers and pesticides, artificial synthetic pesticides and fertilizers for a very long time. Now, <clears throat> the good part of that was we were able to increase our agriculture production and feed a lot of people. What we are seeing now is overuse or continuous use of pesticides and fertilizers is actually creating side effects. What kind of side effects? One is the pest resistance is going up. So every time you need to come up with new set of pesticides to be able to fight new pests. And every time you apply a new set of pesticides, the pest's resistance keeps going up. That's an unintended consequence. Second type of consequence, we have, due to overuse of fertilizers, we have reduced or to a certain extent eroded soil's fertility, the primary productivity. Now, if you keep applying more and more of fertilizers, the output of the yield refuses to grow. That's another unintended side effect or consequence of our actions. And there are various examples. If you have to accommodate more cars in the city, you expand the roads and you decongest your traffic. But the moment you do that, the extra capacity is quickly taken up by more cars and more transport systems on road. And after a time delay, you are back with the same problem of congestion. So if you think about it a little more, we are surrounded by such examples where our own interventions often create outcomes which we are not expected. The reason is because social systems are interacting with your economic systems and physical systems. And these interactions often surprise us because the behavior of the system is emerging over time. Systems thinking will help you to understand what kind of interactions exist and what kind of emergence of systems behaviors should we expect. Now, systems thinking is not a tool which can help you predict future reality, but it can always help you understand reality better. So let's come to the second point, what systems thinking is. So here are some pointers. Systems thinking is a way of thinking. There are various ways of thinking, you can think linearly, you can think multidimensionally, you can think in systems. So systems thinking essentially is a way of thinking or understanding how real world systems operate. And one of the critical things in systems thinking is we say there is always a feedback. If A causes B, there is a possibility that B would again come back and influence A. And that's what we call a feedback process. So in systems thinking, the way of thinking is rooted in feedback theory. Saying if we consume groundwater, over time, the groundwater would go down, which would come back and impact our rate of consumption. Or if we emit too much of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, over time, the feedback we'll get from the atmosphere is that climate or weather patterns will start changing. So we are surrounded in a world where there is continuous feedback system from cause and effect and back from effect to the cause. Systems thinking is a method for systemic diagnosis. Now, there are various tools in systems thinking which you can use to perform diagnosis of a system. What are the interconnections? What are the parts? How are those parts related? How are they interacting? Where is the dominance in the system? Where is the leverage? Where is the redundancy? And using these things, you can start performing a systemic diagnosis of any situation that you're dealing with. Which then also brings us to the point of doing analysis of complicated or complex systems. It's also a method for building consensus. Now, why do I say that? I say this because most of us have our own imaginations and perceptions about reality, just like the elephant and the blind man. How do you help people to see each other's mental models or perceptions about reality. Systems thinking could help you do that. If you can get all of them help see that they don't really have a full picture of reality and the reality is much more bigger than what they can see, 
you can help them improve collaborative conversations between each other. And through that process, you can help them show what they don't know, what they could possibly know, and appreciate that each one of them has understood a part of reality, which is very beneficial to each one of them. So we learn from each other. And that's how through a systems thinking process and using various tools, you can help build a method for consensus building. Systems thinking is also useful for identifying impact pathways. Just like I gave you some examples. If you did a particular intervention, what kind of impact it could potentially generate? Would it result into improving improving agriculture yield? Would it result into decongestion of roads? Uh, would it result into sustainable water management? What kind of impact pathways could we expect? Some which you had anticipated, most which you had not anticipated. So it can tell you various what if possibilities about by studying the systems interactions and saying, okay, if I had to work on these part of the parts of the system, would I reach the ends that I wish to reach? It is also useful for building insights and foresights because very often we may not have thought about certain relationships which would be existing in the system. For example, if you are working in an early childhood education system, you could perhaps be focusing all your energies in improving the teaching materials, training the teachers, getting the classroom environment right, providing worksheets, add notes, and textbooks. But you may have avoided or neglected the whole point of how the parents interact with the students at home. Are you creating the similar environment at home or are you having any interventions which strengthens the relationship, feedback relationship between parents and students? If you have looked at that, have you understood what are the goals of the school leadership and are you working with the school leadership to improve the relationship between parents and school leadership, teachers and school leadership and between parents and teachers? So by studying these relationships, it can help you build insights saying, aha, this is one area which I think is important to look at. And by doing that exercise, you can also develop a foresight saying, maybe this is where we should reach or these could be our goals. So this is what I think systems thinking is. So third thing, what system thinking isn't? Well, systems thinking is not a tool to predict future reality. <clears throat> now, there's a very fine distinction here. We say that if you understand the relationships between parts, you can understand the behavior of the system. Now, some would interpret this as understanding the future reality or predicting the future reality. Now, there's a fine difference when you want to forecast where you would reach and when you want to develop a foresight about where you could potentially reach. And that is where the systems thinking piece is situated. It could tell you multiple future possibilities. Which possibility is a certainty is not what systems thinking can tell you. Because complex systems has multiple feedback relationships, some which we understand, most that we may still not be able to understand. Hence, to say with certainty and point precision is that this is where the future is going to be. That's not what systems thinking is for. Systems thinking is for you to understand under what conditions, what kind of future possibilities exist. There could be two, there could be five, there could be 20 possibilities. And we don't really know what possibilities would become reality. But we know what conditions would create those realities. And then we work on those conditions. Systems thinking is not a tool to control reality. We are not looking to say that we have now understood reality and I want reality to behave the way I want it to be. Because as I said earlier, all our understanding about real world systems is rather limited and it will always remain limited. So there are a few things which may not be in our control, which we may not understand. So system thinking is not a tool to control reality, but it is rather a tool to better understand reality. 
system thinking is also not meant to identify who is to be blamed. That's perhaps the easiest thing to figure out. Saying, so, aha, uh -huh, because we did over applications of fertilizers and pesticides, now we have a problem of flattening of yield curves across the world. So who is to be blamed? Is it the people who applied fertilizers? Is it the people who produced fertilizers? Is it the people who first demanded fertilizers? Is it the person or people who had the vision of having fertilizers? Who's to be blamed? Systems thinking is not to figure out or to identify who is to be blamed. It is rather a tool to identify what are the leverages in the system and what are the things in the system which if you work upon could bring about a desired change. So there is no blame game in systems thinking or rather you should not use systems thinking to identify who is to be blamed but rather it is a tool to identify who is to be what leverages should we work upon. Systems thinking is also not to win arguments for the sake of winning arguments. We don't want to think in systems or understand relationships so that we just win arguments for the sake of winning. Systems thinking is basically to understand how things are interconnected in order to build collaborative action. It is not meant to build more polarization. It is not meant to separate the systems thinkers from non-systems thinkers because that in, it, in itself is a non-systems approach. So systems thinking is meant to build robust communications. It is not meant to win arguments. It is meant to help people understand each other's mental models better, understand their stories and their narratives a little better. If you use, use systems thinking for the sake of winning arguments, then basically nobody's benefiting from the whole learning of systems thinking. Rather, over time, people may start talk, talking to you. Systems thinking is also not a magic band. <clears throat> it cannot solve all problems at once. What I'm saying, it will look like systems thinking is the piece which will help us understand everything on Earth. Well, it will help you understand more than what you know now, but it will not help you to solve all problems at once. Remember, Einstein says, they said this and I'm quoting, today's problems comes from yesterday's solutions and today's solutions will create tomorrow's problems. But I think systems thinking is useful to reduce the severity and repeatability of problems that we are dealing with today. I repeat, systems thinking is useful to reduce the severity and repeatability of the problems that we are trying to deal with. This means is that if you're dealing with a wicked problem, then which has been persistent, it has been coming back to you time and over again. Every time you think you have solved it, after some time it comes back to haunt you. It's time to use systems thinking because systems thinking will help you to reduce the repeatability and severity of the problem on hand. Why do I say this? Again, I'll quote somebody who said that, and it's Einstein, who said that you cannot solve the problem using the same thinking that created the problem. And thus, systems thinking is a powerful tool to do that. But it's not a tool which will help you solve all problems at once. It is not a magic wand. Some books uh, which I could recommend on systems thinking. The Fifth Discipline by Peter Senge, uh, one of the most popular books on systems thinking, uh, which I encourage you to read. The Systems Thinking Playbook, which has many examples which you can practice. Business Dynamics by Professor John Sturman. It talks about computer modeling, but it also has enough chapters dedicated to soft systems, which is basically systems thinking. Third book I recommend is Systems Thinking for Social Change by David Peter Strzok. It has examples on how he has used systems thinking to work on social complex social problems 
like crime, homelessness, etc. The fourth book I have put here is Thinking in Systems by Tony Lamedos. This book uh, blends the modeling part of systems thinking and the stories of systems thinking and the good practice of systems thinking very well. So if you're interested to read on systems thinking, these are some of the books that I would recommend that you begin with. Some online websites that you can go to, the systemsthinker.com. It has multiple articles by various systems thinkers and authors, all clubbed and put at one common place on various disciplines, business, management, climate change, the method of systems thinking, public policy, and on and on. Donalameadows.org. This website has all the material that Donla Meadows had worked on and some of the articles that she wrote as a weekly column. And I would encourage you to read this. It has a very rich history, right from 1970s to now. Systemdynamics.org. This is the website of the Global Society on Systems Thinking and System Dynamics, which you can go to. And you will get a lot of conference papers and proceedings, which you can refer to. You can download the bibliography, search for the kind of themes that you work on, and download papers. Then we have Creative Learning Exchange, which has a lot of models, examples, free available books, which you can pick up, read. It has examples, and I encourage you to do that. icsystemsexchange.com. This is a website where people have uploaded their models online for others to see, play with those models, generate their own scenarios, test their own understanding, and comment about it. There's a whole host of models which have been uploaded on various themes. And I encourage you to go there, test your mod, test the models, go over the policy testing piece, and it's good fun to do that. icsystems.com, so this is a company which makes one of the softwares on systems thinking called Stella. And if you go out to their website, they do regular webinars, they have training material, articles and books, which you would be greatly benefited to read by. They also have a newsletter, which talks on systems practice around the world. Now, let me show you how does, what is the visualization of systems thinking? What does it look like? Let me see if this screen is available to you. Can you see the external screen? Uh, not okay, so I will share my screen. Thank you. So, so if you see this, this is a sample causal loop diagram of a project that we had done. And this is a part of a paper which was recently published in a journal, which talks about livestock interacting with uh, invasive species, Prosopis juliflora, in a grassland ecosystem, which impacts the fodder availability, and thereby impacts the profitability of livestock, which again comes back and impacts livestock itself. Now this is what we call a feedback system. Again, as livestock goes up, the total income of that local region goes up, the profitability of livestock goes up, which helps people to stock up more livestock. And that's one of the reasons why livestock populations in some of the local spaces has gone up. But if there is invasive species in your area, then it takes out the grassland area, which reduces fodder availability. And that's why people have to buy fodder from outside, which reduces the profitability of livestock and thus, it does not allow the livestock population to keep going up forever. Similarly, if there is too much of livestock, ultimately, the amount of fodder you need will grow more than the amount of fodder which you have. And thereby, it will again come back and impact the livestock profitability. And that's why your livestock population cannot grow forever. And what if you have a policy of removing the invasive species? If you remove the invasive species, then the area under invasive species could perhaps come down and all these loops will start again interacting with each other to generate a new behavior of the system, which could that the livestock population goes up, oscillates, 
stagnates, temporarily goes down and comes up, et cetera, et cetera. So in the systems thinking model, this is called a causal loop diagram. And we see that how these various loops are basically interacting with each other. And that's what produces the behavior of the system. And when we say behavior of the system, we're referring to any one of this variable, which could be the population of livestock, total income of the people, area under grasslands, profitability, fodder, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a very simplified version of a model that we had made for one of the areas where we are doing a project. And the model keeps getting more and more complicated. But for this webinar purpose, I'm showing you a very simplified higher order diagram of how the interactions between various variables in a system look like. Right. So that's all from my side. And I would be very happy to take your questions now, or you can write to me at the given email address, and we would be very happy to keep interacting with all of you. Thank you. Great, I think we have a few questions here already. And uh, there's a comment, uh, there's a wonderful presentation, so thank you. I think it's very useful for people, for our participants. Uh, there's a question here for you, or if you can touch upon how research process can be explained through systems thinking. And there's a detailed comment. Uh, the participant is asking because the nonprofit teaches literature searching and referencing for health sciences research and reaching out to their activities across India is pretty slow. Uh, so they would love to use your model to present it to, to all authorities, emphasizing the big picture and that literature searching and referencing are important elements in the research process and proper teaching helps the entire process. So if you can touch upon how research process can be explained through systems thinking, that would be useful. Thank you, Parivasha. And thank you, Vasumati Shri Ganesh. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Thank you for the question. Yes, we could talk about uh, the research process and how that process itself could be understood using systems thinking, uh, but may not be right now because it is rather a lengthy way to make a model and come up with showing how the research process works. But what I like is the explanation you're saying because many nonprofit teachers use literature searching and referencing for health sciences and reaching out to our activities across India is pretty slow. Mm -hmm. So basically what you're saying is that you would like to use my model to present it to all authorities uh -huh. emphasize the big picture and that literature searching references and important elements in the research process. Sure. So this basically what you're asking here is a very important point where we go out and make models with the people. So there's one way of making models where I sit in a room, look at the knowledge piece and convert it into a systems thinking model. The other way is I go out and interact with people who are part of the system. So in your case, it could be the nonprofit teachers because my nonprofit teaches, sorry. So it could be the health sciences research and the people who are involved in these activities to show how literature searching and referencing could actually influence or amplify the research process. So if the, if the reaching out of your activities is pretty slow in India, what it tells me is that you're reinforcing loops which can amplify this activity are not really dominant. So how do we make them dominant? Well, that itself is a research question. And for that, we ourselves would need to do a research process. But thanks a lot for this question. And if you write to us, we can talk more about it on how this could be addressed. Thank you, Mihir. Our next question is, how wide should we go to identify the factors contributing to a particular system? So I think if you can, Sandeep, yeah. Okay, thank you, Sandeep. 
how wide should we go to identify the factors contributing to a particular system? Excellent question. This is where uh, I think the importance of boundary or boundary objects in systems thinking come in. Let me give you an example. I, when I was working at Teddy earlier, we had done a project on urban carrying capacity, saying what is the amount of human activities that a city could sustainably address or manage. Now, in this case, city as a system is an open system. The food could come from anywhere in the world. The water could be supplied from beyond the boundaries of the city. The money that flows into the system, the city could be coming from all over the world. Similarly, the people. Now, what does this mean? So if I have to create a model of a city, do I end up creating a model of the world? The answer is no. So this is where we have to make assumptions and create a model boundary. There is no way I could trace where the money is coming from all over the world. So I put a cap on it or make it an exogenous variable in my model. Now, this does not mean that I avoid it, avoid looking at it, but I keep it as an exogenous variable. Similarly for water. Now, the cities have also have a policy of drawing water from river. And then the question comes of interlinking of rivers. So how wide can you go to make the model? Well, you keep water flow coming from rivers as an exogenous variable, and you develop scenarios or test sensitivity by saying, okay, what if the water coming through pipelines from very far places reduced in supply? How would your endogenous system respond to it? How would the city respond to it? So we have something called as per capita liters a day. What if that amount dropped? How it would impact the quality of life of people? So you have to create model boundaries which are feasible for your work, depending on the time you have, the resources you have, and most importantly, what is the purpose of doing the research? Once you have drawn the boundary, all the exogenous variables can be moved to see how it impacts your system, but you don't model those exogenous factors. Thank you, Mihir. Um, we have a question from Abhishek, and he's asking if, even if we study interactions of parts, but inter interventions would still be done in parts. So how can we create interventions which are a good marriage of all the parts and solves issues in totality? Is that even possible is the question. And there is a second part of the question as well. And he's asking if you can clarify if systems thinking can be used for identifying root cause of an issue. Is that possible? Thank you, Abhishek. Thanks a lot for asking this question. Both the questions are very interesting. I'll start with the second one because it is easier to reply. Can you clarify systems thinking can be used for identifying root causes of an issue? Yes, you can. But when you say root causes, there, there are basically relationships in the system which are causing an issue to persist. For example, we say the mosquitoes in the city go up at a certain time in the year, right? In a certain season. And humans face the brunt of it. So we have too many mosquitoes in the room or in the city outside, and how do you deal with it? So what is the root cause here? The root cause is just not mosquitoes. The root cause is the relationships that exist in the system, which leads to the breeding grounds of mosquitoes and the uh, growth of mosquitoes in the city which perpetuate the breeding grounds. So there are relationships that exist in the system, which are root causes and not just a variable in the system, which could be a root cause. We can't say, say it is just wastewater, which is causing mosquitoes. We can't say it is just mosquitoes. It is the relationship between the two and the breeding grounds, which cause it. So when we say root causes, these are relationships and loops, which cause it. Coming to your first point, even if you study interactions of parts, but interventions would still be done in parts. That is true, 100% true. How can we create interventions which are a good marriage of all the parts and solves issues in totality, are robust? Is that even possible? Partially, yes, partially, no. We'll never be reaching a situation where we have solved all the problems and we'll have no problems in the future. That's never going to happen because we'll keep facing different challenges. We are living in a world which is evolving, right? The ecological systems are evolving, human systems are evolving, technological systems are evolving. 
So the interactions between these parts will keep evolving also. We cannot even imagine those connections, how it would evolve in future. But we would continue to intervene in parts. So somebody would come up with a technological fix. Somebody would come up with a social fix. What we have to be careful, and when we say we, we are saying when you systems thinking, we have to be careful is that we have to understand how the technological parts are interacting with social parts and the social parts are again creating a feedback on technological parts. If you understand the relationship between interventions, then our uh, solutions could be very robust. I'll give an example of this. If we want to fix a problem, say, uh, we have become very efficient in our lightings. The energy efficiency of lightings has gone up, but the rebound effect of that is humans or people's behavior has also adapted accordingly. So we may be remaining our lights on more frequent for a little longer time. We may be using lights more often. Now this neutralizes the gains which we are hoping to get from energy efficiency of lighting. Now this is a classical interaction of technology and the social system or human system, which creates a rebound effect and does not really allow us to reach the goals that we had hoped to reach by improving our energy efficiencies. Thank you. Thank you, Meher. Um, we have next question. I think there are too many questions here, but we'll, we'll choose and we'll just try to answer as many questions as possible. The next question is uh, from Yasin. And um, she's interested in knowing how system thinking is different from just interdisciplinary approach of solving a problem or understanding a case or a problem. Yes, Yasin. I find systems thinking obvious. So do I. And let me tell you, many people do find it obvious. And I'm interacted with students, people running organizations, working on social issues, even family members, parents. We all think that we have to look at problems or systems holistically. And we all say this. Any conference I go, I hear this. People say that, you know, we have to look at systems and how they are connected. So intuitively, all of us understand the value of looking at systems holistically and interdisciplinarily. But the thing is, we lack training or capacities or tools which can enable unlocking of our own capacities to be able to use systems thinking in practice as a life skill. Interdisciplinary approach basically could take you as far as integrated solutions. So if you're working at a problem, you can solve it using 10 disciplines. So let's do all of them and integrate it all. But that's not necessarily systems thinking. Because systems thinking is saying all those 10 solutions, how do they interact with each other? And potentially some of your solutions could be competing with each other. Okay. So Parijat is asking, and it's a clarifying question. Um, system thinking, is it a way of understanding the problem or is it a way of finding the solution or both? And what's the process that um, you can follow to make a model of a system? Okay, so there is a process and maybe we'll do one more webinar where we talk about the systems thinking process and we could take a case. But just to give you pointers in a systems thinking process, how do you make a model first? is you have to familiarize yourself with the problem at hand or the system at hand. How do you do that? One is you understand historic trends. Say if you're working on water management, what is the trend in the groundwater? Has it been going down? Has it been going up? Is it stagnating? Is it oscillating? Does it go down exponentially? What is happening there? You make those trends. Then you go down in the next step and identify the causes which are responsible for those trends. So you can come up with 20 factors, say bore well, free electricity, increasing income, family size, on and on and on. You come up with all those causes. In the third step, you start identifying relationships between those causes. And that is the process of connecting causes with each other. And that's what starts making the model, a causal model, where all the causes that you listed down as a laundry list actually have a causality with each other. The fourth step, you set up the model. You go back to your stakeholder. You validate your model with their understanding. 
maybe in step three you make the model with them and in the step five once you have developed enough confidence in your model you say okay now i'm going to look at all the causal chains and start identifying impact pathways saying what if i intervened in the system will it give me the desired results what are the loops which will become dominant or which may restrict me from achieving the desired ends and that's how you diagnose the system and after that in step six you go back with through the people and create a shared vision say hello folks this is what i think is happening in the system if it did this this is where you will reach do you agree with me or if you disagree what are the things that we should change in the model and that is a slow process it's a long-term process in systems thinking we also say also say slow is fast thank you Meher. Uh, Shitakshi wants to ask if you can please share some references for analyzing sustainability at the village level in India. Yes, I can. And uh, to be accurate here, I may want to type or write down and send it to you. So if you, if you have your contacts, which I hope we will, we will uh, we'll write to you with all the references. And I'll be very happy to share this, some of my own work that we have been doing and the work that I know of others. Great, thanks. So we'll get back to you, Shatakshi. Um, there's a, yeah, so there's a two part to one question and it's from Tom. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, so first part of the question says purpose, unified whole to achieve purpose. Do systems have a non-human purpose and when a human-centered or human purpose intersects with a non-human service, can there be happiness or just unhappiness? Okay. <laughs> the second part says, while systems theory doesn't provide answers, what about weighing probabilities and related studying behaviors to better grasp human actions? So how does the application of prob probability analysis and behavioral science influence your thesis? Well, those are two powerful questions and we could perhaps spend an evening talking about it, <laughs> but we don't have an evening. So I'll respond to you rather quickly. <laughs> okay. So I'll respond quickly. First purpose, unified whole to achieve purpose. Do systems have a non-human purpose? Of course they do. The forests were there before humans came. And before forests, there was something else. So of course, they do have a purpose. Some which we know, most which we can't know. But that doesn't mean that they don't have a purpose. The second part, and when a human-centered or human purpose intersects with a non-human service, can there be happiness or just have an happiness? Now, what this question means is that, have you understood the relationship that humans share with nature or non-humans when we call it? Do we understand that we live in a web of life and that web of life has causalities? Some that we can understand perhaps, most that we may never be able to understand because it is evolving, it is adapting. So can we listen to the wisdom of the system and live through that? If we do that, then there could be happiness. If we try to control reality, to predict reality, to force our way, to dominate, then there would be unhappiness. Because in that process, we could perhaps start destroying our own relationship with nature. Second, while systems theory doesn't provide answers, what about weighing probabilities and related studying behaviors to better grasp human actions? How does the application of probability analysis in real science? Systems theory or systems thinking do provide answers, but we don't say that we get all the answers for all the problems at once. So you could perhaps weigh probabilities, you could test some of those probabilities and assumptions. And when you talk about behaviors of human actions, now, this is very interesting, what you're saying. Because when you talk about humans, humans are just not complex systems, they are complex adaptive systems. So humans adapt over time. So I may create a model of myself, but tomorrow when I get up, I may have adapted my logics. And that's why I may decide something tomorrow very differently than what I'm deciding today. So our behavioral sciences is one of the key things that I think systems thinking should look at. And it does look at that. 
you could perhaps map all the possible behaviors that we have identified in the past as a model relationship and then allow the model to inform us what kind of possible responses you could expect. But again, models are as good as human mind or representation of reality that we have in human mind. So we'll have to continuously adapt the model as we adapt our own selves. Okay. So we just have a few more minutes, I think last four minutes. And um, there is a question. Uh, it can be take, answered over the email in a detailed manner. But if there, you want to answer me here for a couple of minutes, the question is from Abhishek. It says, could you share systems thinking model for waste management with regards to Indian cities over email? Yeah, so we will do that. But if you, if you have anything to say about it, have any experience to share about it, we can talk about it for a couple of minutes so i would encourage you to type these keywords online systems thinking waste management in the cities and you would get uh, some literature on that i have just not made a model on waste management only for a city so i don't have anything to share with you but uh, if you need any help on searching the right right literature most welcome to write to us great thank you so I would like to thank everybody for attending our webinar and I hope it has been useful and answered some basic questions around the systems thinking. We will answer a couple of questions over an email and you can reach out to Mihir. Um, he's shared his details over here and we'll be, uh, yeah, we'll be more than happy to answer your questions. And thank you Mihir so much for providing the, the knowledge around systems thinking. I'm sure it's been very useful. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. And all of you, be well.